Hello and welcome to the Bible study, the Gospel of St. Matthew, Session 7. This is Dernatic, the pastor of St. Sarkis Church in Douglaston, New York. Today we are studying the third discourse. This section is called the Parables of the Kingdom. In the introduction we said that there are five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. The first being the second, the Sermon on the Mount starting in chapter 5, the second discourse being the missionary sermon, specific instructions given to the disciples of Jesus. And today we go to the third discourse, and we will read about the parables of the kingdom. Today we will be focusing on Matthew chapter 13, and we will encounter a series of parables here. And we know that Jesus had already used few parables, but we have here a shift, a, a sudden series of eight parables back to back, and there's a shift in the teaching method of Jesus. And for us to understand this, we need to kind of remember um, the narrative in Matthew chapter 11 and 12, which highlighted the division between those who follow Jesus and those who do not receive his teachings, um, those who refuse to repent, the Pharisees, uh, who are plotting basically his death. So this background is very important to understand the parables in chapter 13 um, because of this continuous uh, division. The contrasts between good soil and bad soil, as we will read, wheat and weeds, the good fish and the bad fish, fish uh, these all shed light on the positive and the negative responses to Christ's ministry. We will read other parables that highlight the proper response of the disciples who have given up everything for the kingdom, like man selling all of his, all of uh, their possession for that hidden treasure or the pearl of the great price. And um, if, finally, we will, we will also read in other parables how the kingdom of God that starts small will grow and despite some bad soil or bad seeds or bad fish, the kingdom will produce an abundant harvest and a great catch. Before we go to the text, I would like to give a brief uh, introduction or maybe some information on the word parable, um, that you know, parables are extended metaphors or similes that are often extended into short narratives they are used for teaching. The the Greek for parable is parabole, uh, which means placing beside, in contrast with hyperbole, which, you know, placing it far away. So parables come in forms of uh, little sayings, riddles, proverbs, narratives that illustrate the truth and make comparison to the real life situations. We find parables uh, in the Old Testament and the the, the proper name for parables in Hebrew is mashal, uh, which refers to cryptic statement intended to sim stimulate thought. So you hear the story and then you're thinking about it, you're contemplating on it, and basically you're using your imagination, and that's a beautiful thing. So we will read eight parables today in chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew. And the first parable that we read is the parable of the sower. Again, take a minute to read the scripture text. And by the way, all the texts that I use in the Bible study are the New Revised Standard Version um, of the Bible. So, I will not give a lot of explanation here, because let me tell you why. Because when we continue reading, we will see that Jesus is giving interpretation to the parable that he spoke. So we're going to say more about that in a minute. But what I want you here to kind of, um, the highlights that I made in color red, um, we see that Jesus is beside the sea, and the crowds gather around him, and he goes, he goes into the boat, and he sits there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. So the sitting and the standing, this may sound like a little detail here, but um, we see that this is part of the Jewish tradition of a 
teacher of great importance, teaching. This is the posture of the um, Jewish teacher. So Jesus assumes that posture as he starts teaching again. And he told them many things in parables. So he was not focusing on uh, teaching with parables earlier on. The first two discourses were clear teachings. Remember, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, uh, the clear instruction that was given to the disciples in the, in the second discourse. But now we hear or we see a shift here. He starts using parable in response to the growing animosity between those who do not receive the message and Jesus and his followers. He makes a shift so that those who are listening, they are now contemplating and going deep with their faith. And those who are not listening, they, they will dismiss the message because they are not putting the time to go deep uh, to understand. The same thing applies to us today. When we read a parable, uh, any parable, from any gospel, the true Christian will devote time to sit down, study the Word of God, contemplate, and try to immerse themselves in that story, ask themselves the question, where am I? Which group am I part of? But for those who have no faith, this will sound like an old story. And they're like, why am I reading this? So keep this in mind as we go through uh, the parables of Jesus. It's important for us to kind of note that this is the very first time that uh, the Bible tells us that what's coming next um, are parables. See, uh, and he told them many things in parables. So those stories are identified by the author, by Matthew, that these are parables. And the parables that Jesus speaks, they come from the world where they, they live in, the agricultural world, the fields, the sea, the nets, pe things that people can relate to. Maybe it's difficult for us to relate to in the 21st century, and that's why we do Bible study, so that we can understand what Jesus is saying. So basically, in this parable, Jesus identifies four kind of spots where the seeds uh, are landing. And again, just read this. I will not give any explanation here, because Jesus will give the explanation at the end of uh, this section here. Upon hearing the, this first parable, the disciples ask him, why do you speak to them in parables? Now, when we go to the next slide, we, we will see that Jesus explaining uh, the parable of, of, of the sower to, to his disciples. And we will think that, oh, maybe the disciples were not paying attention and Jesus wanted to explain the meaning of the parable to them. But I don't think the disciples had a very hard time understanding it. The question here is very clear. Why do you speak to them in parable? Why the shift in the tone and the method of, uh, of teaching? And Jesus tells the disciples that the knowledge um, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So to those who have been open to Christ's teachings, those are the ones who will perceive even more. The highlight here, for those who have more, will be given. Um, or maybe we, we need to change the, the way I read it. For those who have, more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. So a lot of times when people read this and they are not fully aware of the context where these words are given or spoken, uh, they naturally say, that's not fair. That's not fair. But this is not about your material possessions or, or, you, or anything like that, that Jesus is talking about. But this is about the disposition of our hearts. If our heart is open, and if we're willing to receive, God will give us more. 
God will give us more understanding. God will give us more wisdom. And God will give us more grace. But if the doors of our hearts are shut, then we are closing that opportunity to to receive the grace. So that's one reason why Jesus speaks in parables. And the second reason here is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. So Jesus is saying, I'm not doing anything that I was not supposed to do. Look, even Isaiah spoke to me, uh, spoke to you about the work of the Messiah and how he will speak in parables. And then he concludes by saying, truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So try to put yourselves in the position of the disciples, peasants, um, maybe farmers, fishermen for sure, right? People who lived on the margins of the society, Galileans, and the Son of God addressing them, he tells them that you are more privileged than the prophets were. I think that's very powerful. And remember, what we are going to read in the very last verses of Matthew, where Jesus will instruct his disciples to go and make disciples. So if you consider yourself to be a disciple of Jesus, then you have a lot more privileges than the prophets of the Old Testament had. In verse 18 of chapter 13 of Matthew, we see Jesus explaining uh, the parable of the sower. So Jesus, note this, Jesus is speaking the parable to the crowds, but he is explaining the parable to the disciples, to the inner circle. And I want you to pay attention to this little detail here. Although two, maybe two slides ago, I said that Jesus is taking the material of his parables from their daily life, from the uh, world of agriculture. But also it's important for us to kind of um, remember that in different parts of the Old Testament, for example, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 to 11, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 to 28, and Hosea in chapter 2, verse 25, God was depicted as a sower, and the seeds represented his word that would accomplish his purpose, producing an abundant crop. And here in this parable, Jesus and his seeds, the word, uh, is proclaiming the, co- the gospel of the kingdom. And the different soils represented different kinds of responses to his ministry. First, for some, uh, some are completely unres. So let's take a look at uh, the interpretation that Jesus provides to us. He identifies the first group, the seeds that fell on the side of the road, as the ones who do not understand the word of God. These are the Pharisees that, you know, the preaching of Jesus does not make sense to them at all. So those are the ones who are rejecting and uh, the devil is taking away all the seeds that was going to do anything in their lives. The second group are the ones who received it and they receive it with immediate joy. And those are the ones who unfortunately are not able to put the words into practice when trouble and persecution arises they cannot continue with their faith the third are the ones uh, who hear the word uh, this is the third group where you know the, the, it fell among thorns but the cares of the word and the lure of wealth choke the word it doesn't say wealth but the lure of wealth thinking that you know if i'm if I'm wealthy, you know, my life will be will be different. This is very interesting. It was the same in the times of Jesus, and it's the same thing today. And finally, the one who hears the word and understands it is the, 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 the seed that falls into good soil and indeed bears fruit and yields. So this is 
where we have to be as Christians, in a place where the Word of God is increasing and multiplying, and we are feeling the effects of the Word of God changing our lives, changing the lives of people who are around us in hundredfold and sixty and thirty. Jesus is interested in real results as part of the change that his word and his preaching and his kingdom brings to our lives. In this section, uh, we encounter th three parables concerning growth. And the first parable is the parable of weeds among weeds. And this describes a real scenario from first century agricultural world. Because there were Roman laws that specifically forbade sabotaging of crops by planting uh, wheat. And um, wheat, in this case, is darnel, the poisonous plant. Those roots would eventually in, be inter, become intertwined with the rest of the, of the wheat. And to remove, to remove it without damaging it would, would be very, very difficult. So this is one of my favorite parables because it deals with the eternal question of good, of good and evil. In this parable, again, I will not give much interpretation because eventually we will read the words of Jesus explaining this parable just the way that we saw uh, in the parable of the sower here. Um, but here we see that God is sowing the good seeds in the fields. And then at night, while everybody was sleeping, the enemy is putting the bad seeds so the creation of God is good, and the, there are evil forces that are present to this day. And we see the effect of the, of the evil in the world. So this should give us a clear idea of the nature of the world where we operate. And the second point that is very important, at least to me, is the second part that I highlighted, um, where uh, God says, let both of them grow together until harvest um, so this is this is our reality it's very easy for for me to kind of um, be judgmental and judge you know people around me by saying oh this guy is bad this woman is evil this and that but that doesn't change my reality because the mandate is we need to grow together we need to be together in this world we need to face the challenges as followers of Christ until the day of harvest. Because in reality, um, you know, we, we always like to think of ourselves as uh, the good seeds, you know, and people around us as, as bad. That's, you know, that are part of our defense mechanism. But what if we are uh, the bad seeds? What if we are the weeds that, 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 that uh, are choking life out of the, the wheat? Let think about it for a minute from that perspective. And then you will realize that God give, is giving us a second chance every day to change. So we move to the next slide and uh, we see the similarity of wheat and darnel. You know, and when they start growing, there's no difference. Even when they start becoming mature and forming heads, you see, you still see some um, similarities, and I picked this from um, um, a simple Google search. Darnel is a poisonous uh, plant that is. It's a poisonous plant that is uh, in the field. It's not only similar, but it's also poisonous. Just think about it from that perspective: similar, but poisonous. Sometimes that's how we look at things around us, the bad things. We're thinking that, oh, yeah, this is good. This, this, this is giving me some sort of satisfaction or whatever. Without going into details, you know what I'm talking about. But eventually, those seemingly harmless things become uh, poison and toxins in our lives. Similarly, let's go to the next slide. As we move forward, we will... Read the parable of Jesus of uh, mustard seed, and he will describe the mustard seed as uh, one of the smallest seeds 
but it has the potential to become a big shrub. Um, look at the size of the shrub. Uh, it's pretty tall, as tall as that uh, grown man that is standing next to the shrub. So we move to uh, the, the second parable in this section, parables concerning growth, and we read here, the parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it, when it has grown, it is greatest of shrubs and became a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So the size uh, of the seed doesn't matter. The quality is important because it has the potential to grow and to become a full tree. And, uh, you know, the detail here um, might sound decorative, but no, it's not. Uh, having branches where trees will come and build their nests is, is an image of each disciple growing in their faith, becoming agents of ministry, and inviting Gentiles, the birds here are the Gentiles, who will build their nest on the root or on the branches of the Word of God. Another parable of growth is the parable of yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Uh, leaven and, and, and yeast has a negative connotation most of the time. But not in this case. Again, this is maybe, I shouldn't use the word redundant, but it's a similar parable to the one that we read before. And it's about the growth of the Word of God. Once we have it in us, you know, it only grows. It cannot stay in a position that is kind of the same. There's no plateau in the life of our faith. Remember, uh, when we were dealing with the first discourse of, of of the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, he said, he said, Be therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the sky, the sky is the limit. So in verse 36, Jesus explains the parable of the weeds and the wheat to his disciples. Again, they go to the house. This is in the privacy that they have Jesus along with his disciples. They ask him, and he answered, uh, and he gave the interpretation of the parable of uh, the first parable of the three parables of uh, that concerning growth that we just spoke about. So let's just read together what Jesus, or how Jesus answered. The one who sows the good seeds is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seeds are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. Jesus gives an interpretation to uh, the parable that he spoke about publicly. And by doing so, Jesus implicitly is teaching us that the scripture needs to be studied. And we need to have interpretation for the Word of God. And this is what we are trying to do. I am not giving you interpretations or understanding that I think about <laughs> before I go to sleep, but I do my fair of studies. And we always try to present to you what our church believes. It is very important to have that consistency because look what is happening here. Jesus is giving the interpretation or the explanation, uh, the teachings, uh, the depth of his teachings to his disciples. And the disciples are the ones who are going and establishing the church everywhere. So that having that continuation, or maybe in simple words, what we call tradition, and tradition, this is with double T, 
uh, I'm sorry, with capital T, um, this is what keeps us alive. And I cannot emphasize this highly enough that it's very important for us to kind of know where are we getting our answers from? Who is teaching us about the Word of God? There are so many um, self-proclaimed teachers out there who I don't know where they get uh, their interpretation, but we have a history, and that history is uh, over 2,000 years old, and we are part of that. And I encourage you to be part of any Bible study that the Armenian Church is providing uh, locally or uh, online in, in a format format like this. Next, Jesus speaks of uh, three parables. Let's take a look at the first two. Um, you know, there are very short parables here. The first two are very similar. They have similar themes. Um, we have the first one, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The second one is similar. It's the pearl that somebody finds, sells everything, and goes to buy uh, the pearl that uh, he found. So there are two very similar themes here. The first theme is the theme of um, being hidden. You know, they find something that not everyone is able to see. Not everyone is able to appreciate the value. And this is uh, some very appropriate to the to the overall theme of the chapter. We have people who are uh, not seeing, not accepting what Jesus is presenting to them. So that, that you have that first theme of certain things not being obvious to everyone. And the second idea is the idea of urgency. When people find the treasure or find the field where the treasure is hidden, um, they go and they sell everything. They go and they sell everything to buy that pearl of great value. So that idea of urgency uh, is very much important here. Um, when we find the kingdom of God, we need to, to act urgently. We cannot postpone. We cannot say, oh, I, I have time. One day when I retire, when I am in my uh, 70s and 80s, then I will get to know God. There's no good time or better time than today. Today is the best time because today is the present. And the present is a present from God, right? So the third parable here, uh, Jesus says again, the kingdom of God is like a net. So in this parable, Jesus is um, giving the analogy of the dragnet that is um, people use at that time. So uh, when they when they get the catch of fish, uh, the fishermen go ashore and put the good fish into a basket and throw the throw out the bad. So this is uh, this parable is kind of connected to the parable before of the uh, the wheat and the weeds. And uh, again, it's uh, the to the tone here is about the judgment of God and um, the fact that we will be accountable of uh, the nature of the life that we have lived, the nature of the choice that we have made in our lives. So uh, this part is concluded. Uh, by the way, this is the conclusion of the, of the third discourse here. And we read the words of Jesus when he asks a question to his disciples. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. So Jesus is kind of giving his disciples, if you wish, the authority to kind of give explanation to the word of God and to be teachers of his word in this, uh, in this universe. We move to the last part of today's study, and this is part of uh, next week's uh, study. Uh, it's part of a narrative, and this is uh, Jesus being rejected in his hometown. And uh, this is very interesting. This is very, very personal. 
they came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogues so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. This is very profound only because people of his hometown knew him. They knew uh, the parents. They knew Mary and Joseph. And they knew uh, the clan the cousins as we uh, as we accept in our teachings um they were they were not they they did not find credibility in the work of jesus and jesus was offended when he said a prophet or prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their own house and jesus was not able to perform um deeds of power why because of lack of faith so faith is very important um of course god can do whatever god wants to do but our response the disposition of our hearts uh, the desire to see mighty deeds of god in our lives is absolutely important remember every time that jesus performed a miracle he asked and he looked for faith and he was not able to do that in his hometown because of lack of faith so this parable you know on one hand jesus last time we concluded by um jesus's open invitation saying that everyone who hears my word you know they are part of my family and here today we are concluding Jesus going to his hometown and being rejected. We, as we immerse ourselves into the scripture, we can ask ourselves, to which group do we belong? Are we part of his family? Or maybe we got way too comfortable with things around us. And church and... Uh, our religious observations are only traditions with a small t. Uh, and um, nothing good, nothing miraculous can come out of it. We have reduced God and his mystery. We have domesticated God and God fits in our back pocket. If that's the case, we are on the wrong path. And the words of Jesus here uh, invite us to have this wake-up call and to change course we will stop here i hope you enjoyed this short presentation today i believe this is shorter than the previous ones and um, please email me your questions if you have questions or comments i read all your emails maybe sometimes i do not respond to your emails and i apologize for that i know that sounds very rude but uh, i read your emails and i pray for you all may god be with you thank you very much